Star Citizen, an ongoing attempt at what aims to be the largest, fully persistent, fully immersive, universal sandbox MMO of its kind. It's a lot of words, but it's a hell of a project. Complete with planets, space stations, cities, outposts, and professions. With a whopping 10 years of development time under its belt, and massive updates being pushed out every single quarter, the game still lives very much in a bug-heavy alpha state. It's no wonder that at every opportunity, criticism of the cost and production time of this project continues to make headlines. Even the word scam is thrown around from time to time, but that doesn't mean that we can't enjoy the ambition being presented to players. The real question is, can the average Joe actually grasp the full scope of this game? A project so technically complex that many just don't bother to do the research to understand what the developers are aiming to achieve for the players. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to Legacy Gaming. My name is Livid, and as someone who has both played and watched this game evolve week after week for the past decade, hopefully I'll be able to provide you with a digestible overview of the project, why it's possibly worth supporting, and maybe even answer the overarching question, what really is Star Citizen? Now before we even begin, I think it's incredibly important to preface with a few things. First off, nowhere in this video or any of our videos on Star Citizen will we ever tell you to purchase anything beyond the starter game package in order to play it. It's a title still in heavy active development, meaning everything is work in progress and still subject to change. And anything that you decide to spend money on is purely in support of the game's development. Additionally, there are major events, such as the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo, that happens every year in mid-November, that not only showcases the entire library of ships currently in the game, but also lets you rent them completely free of charge. Now, there is also typically a lengthy free-fly event in conjunction with these expos that allow prospective players to hop right into the game without spending a single dime. Now, together, these allow anyone to hop right in, try out everything from the starter ships to endgame ships, immerse themselves in full gameplay loops, and see if they even enjoy the project in its current state. If you do end up liking it, and you choose to purchase a starter package, not only do I recommend that you use a referral code to secure yourself some extra in-game starting currency, but I strongly advise you to wait until they offer up a free smaller ship like the Grav Bike or the Argo MPV during a referral event. It's basically them giving you $30 to $40 for free, so why wouldn't we tell you to take advantage of that when it's available? If you happen to miss one of these events, we will also have the most up-to-date breakdown of the various starter packages linked here and in the description below, when ready. Second, it's important to understand that the developers, Cloud Imperium Games, are actually developing two games simultaneously, Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Squadron 42 is the single-player campaign set within the same universe. It features massive voice acting talent like Gary Oldman, Mark Strong, and even Mark Hamill and it's kept largely under wraps to avoid spoiling a reportedly 70-chapter story. A majority of the studio staff actually spends its time working on this project in particular. Upon completion and release, CIG aims to inject the new locations, ships, enemies, and even gameplay systems that are appropriate into the Star Citizen universe. Now, it's a project that among its player base does draw its own share of ire, purely because it isn't the project a majority initially backed. And while it's honestly a valid criticism, it is still very much happening. Star Citizen, on the other hand, the topic of this video, is the one that you hear about most often. It's a full-on universe sim that features no loading screens, incredible detail and fidelity, and seamless transitions between all pieces of content. When it works, of course. Now you can call your ship to a hangar, dynamically move about within it, transition with full control from atmosphere to space, and set off to anywhere that you want in the vastness of space. One of the defining moments of any Star Citizen experience is the first time that you enter a planet's atmosphere, complete with sound effects and entry burn as you wrestle the gravity that takes hold of your ship. For now, we find ourselves at Microtech, one of the major planets within the Stanton system, the first major system in Star Citizen. It's about as far out from this system's sun as possible. A terraforming error left the planet with unnaturally dense cloud cover, resulting in a much colder than average climate. 
inadvertently making it an ideal location for the company that owns it, Microtech, to house its heat-sensitive manufacturing centers. Now across the entirety of all planets, you'll find unique biomes and weather conditions, all subject to temperatures, humidity levels, and atmospheric compositions. Frigid mountain ranges can give way to lush fields and winding rivers. And this doesn't just stop here. Each planet also features their own array of natural and artificial satellites. On both planets and sometimes their orbiting bodies, you'll come across various points of interest, such as outposts, providing opportunities to not only run into other players, but for picking up and delivering both legal and illicit cargo. You'll even find cave systems, ideal for exploring, looting, and even mining solo or with a couple of friends, both on foot and sometimes by vehicle. Shipwrecks and abandoned colonial outposts provide opportunities for not only further exploration, but for platforming, combat, and even more looting. Then there's bunkers that feature combat objectives, putting you up against both lawful and unlawful forces to watch out for and even loot. These are even being constantly expanded to include more variations, better layouts with unique traversal opportunities, and dynamic objective gameplay. And finally, landing zones, what are easily the most standout locations on each planet or orbiting body. These often feature sprawling cities or settlements owned by entire governments, outlaw groups, or companies, such as Orison on Crusader, Lorville on Hurston, and New Babbage right here on Microtech. While each planet offers a variety of options to engage with, worlds still remain largely empty, as development continues to add more dynamically placed features, such as active colonial outposts and settlements, where quest givers, traders, and factions will all play a substantial role. You'll just have to make sure that your actions don't wind up in your abrupt death. Now, all of this isn't possible without your ship. And while you as a new player might be starting with the humble beginnings of an Aurora or Mustang, eventually you'll be able to progress to bigger and more complex vessels, even ones that can hold land vehicles and other ships. A massive selling point of Star Citizen is the sheer detail and complexity that CIG puts into the hundreds of ships available to the player. Now I'm sure you've seen some of the over-the-top commercial advertisements for some of the ships in Star Citizen. And if you haven't, I implore you to go take a look. While some might see these and think they serve no other purpose than to sell players on the latest ship offerings, CIG actually uses these advertisements in-game as elements of the living, breathing universe and ever-expanding lore. You'll find them on display at expo halls and ship dealers, as I mentioned early on, and you could purchase any ship in-game with currency that you earn through the various gameplay loops, something we'll touch on a little later in the video. All ships in Star Citizen fall into dedicated roles, such as combat, transportation, exploration, industrial, support, racing, and more. Some even fulfill multiple roles, like the Anvil Carrot, housing a medical bay, a drone support bay, massive detachable cargo pods, hangars for both ground vehicles and small support craft, and features for exploration and mapping jump points. While it may have numerous features as an exploration ship, other specialized ships will perform specific tasks better or to a higher degree. Every ship in Star Citizen is created by a different manufacturer that influences not only its visuals, but also core functionality. Take Origin, for example, the BMW of the universe. Here, you'll find high-end vessels that cater to luxury clientele, often having over-the-top amenities, insanely clean line work, and roles that focus in on touring, exploration, and racing. Then you have something on the opposite end of the spectrum, like Argo Astronautics, makers of bold, rugged, and functional industrial ships aimed at cargo hauling, mining, and maintenance. If you want an expanded look at the different manufacturers of Star Citizen, we have a video in the works on that exact topic. As a player in Star Citizen, your experiences aren't just limited to the confines of your ship's cockpit, like other space sims. Given what you just saw, you have the ability to not only log in and wake up on your ship, moving about the interior before taking in the gorgeous view of the nebula that you parked yourself in, but you can do the same aboard a space station or planet side in one of the numerous cities that I mentioned earlier. Vendors at these cities and stations will make their stores available to you, allowing you to stock up on essential items like food, beverages, and medical supplies, all the way to situational gear in the form of weapons, ammo, and even armor each location in the verse containing different offerings. One really awesome thing about Star Citizen is that every sign, map, or visual context clue in the world actually means something, just as it would in the real world. So if you're looking for those stores that we just mentioned, a little reading will almost always set you on the right path. 
You'll then be able to take those purchases and provided your ship has the capacity, store them for use by yourself or even friends, the later opening up your opportunity to make use of bigger and more versatile ships. This is because in Star Citizen, the larger the ship means the larger the crew that you'll need to make it function at a bare minimum. Just because a player has the largest ship in the game doesn't mean that they have an automatic win condition over anyone else. While skill and game knowledge are defining factors to your success in Star Citizen, if you don't have the crew to manage core systems of a larger ship, such as turrets, power distribution, and even utilities like tractor beams and mining lasers, you'll be at a severe disadvantage at best, a sitting duck at worst. Now all the ships and tools at your disposal are there to aid you in your journey through Star Citizen's ever-expanding professions and activities. Now even though things like stat investment and skills were teased during 2022 CitizenCon, Star Citizen remains by and large a skill and knowledge-based experience that increases in effectiveness the more proficient you become. Some of the established and ever-expanding professions include mining and refining, where you'll be able to visit asteroid belts and planetary surfaces in search of lucrative ores and gems, eventually transporting that haul to one of many refineries around the verse, each providing different results in speed and efficiency in an effort to make the most credits for the time spent. Cargo hauling and smuggling have players transporting those very same refined materials, essential goods, or even illicit products from one location to another depending on supply and demand. Physicalized cargo aims to see the cargo become fully movable and lootable, even through ship destruction by other cargo haulers and pirates. Now, should you run out of fuel or munitions, those can be replenished by fellow fuel rats through the refuel and rearm systems, while ships beyond saving will eventually end up in the salvage loop as you seek to squeak out some final credits from derelict ships. There are even additional planned professions in the way of data running, exploration and mapping, mercantilism, homestead construction, and even the long-awaited engineering and expanded multi-crew gameplay, where you'll see players managing power relays, life support, and even component management and repair. Now, I mentioned piracy as a viable gameplay avenue, but the lawful side of bounty hunting is also on the table. You'll have access to both player bounties and high-value AI targets that can range anywhere from FPS ground combat to ship dogfighting. If by some misfortune you find yourself suffering bodily injury during any of these activities, those interested in the medical gameplay loop can become well-versed in the various drugs and healing tools at your disposal to respond to distress beacons, hopefully arriving just in time to bring players back from the brink of death. All of this can be further augmented and improved by both replacing the components on your ship with higher quality ones or investing in the right armor or FPS tools for the job. Just be aware, since Star Citizen is in active development, content across all these professions and activities are not evenly developed, with some severely lacking advanced forms of their systems to others being nearly feature complete. But regardless, they will all earn you some form of money. Outside of earning money and showing off the shiniest, newest ships in the game, players can look forward to a whole host of other progression offerings for their characters, reputation being one of the biggest. As you do work for various NPCs, organizations, or factions, you'll gain reputation, both good and bad, that open up increasingly difficult and more rewarding missions. Affinity with certain factions can either positively or negatively affect your relationships with others. And in the near future, your rep will directly affect the way NPCs react to you. Every death sees you leave behind your body, complete with your gear, weapons, and entire inventory. Sure, you can travel back to where you died, but so can other players. Everything eventually loops back to a fundamental core concept, and ultimately system of the game, the death of a spaceman. Now the ultimate goal for Star Citizen, one that isn't talked about enough, is for your death to matter. And with each death and regeneration at a hospital, your character's cloned genetic profile is supposed to degrade until your character permanently dies. Reputation you've earned, stats you've progressed, things you've earned in game will all be lost with enough deaths. This aims to not only breed more emergent gameplay and RP-like scenarios, but it aims to make interactions with other players, engagement with the law and prison systems, and the high risk, high reward of outlaw gameplay actually matter long-term. It's progression and a true social experiment all in one. On the social side of things, Star Citizen easily has one of the best and most welcoming communities that I've ever witnessed in the video game landscape. Maybe it's the fact that the company is so open with their development, through extensive dev interviews, 
weekly content previews, monthly reports detailing the previous months of work, and even a fully explorable and constantly updated roadmap and progress tracker detailing every single thing made public that is currently being worked on. Or maybe it's from both the levels of cooperation and shenanigans that constantly unfold in Star Citizen's earliest test of dynamic events. Some of which include the likes of Jump Town, where players square off or cooperate with one another to either dispose of or reap the rewards of an overactive drug production facility. Or something like the Siege of Orison, where an entire server of 100 players can team up to wrestle back control of the floating city platforms of Orison from a highly organized terrorist group. The community even runs their own events like ship meetups and fully broadcasted races, a serious sight to witness in person. Things like this are made easier through the ability to add friends in game or head to external website resources to manage player-run clans called organizations, some having thousands of players alone. Regardless of what you're doing or what questions that you may have, chances are someone will be happy to help you along the way. Now there is a sizable offering of content already on the table for Star Citizen. And with the ever-changing and expanding nature of it being a constant work in progress, expect things to drastically change and evolve with time. It's a game that truly doesn't hold your hand very often, even if they're working on that through improved environmental context scans. It leaves it up to you, the player, to map out your own fate, even if the bugs tend to rob you of that quite often. This was just a brief overview of what Star Citizen has to potentially offer you, but I hope it has either piqued your interest in the project or gave you new insight into a game that I think is just massively misunderstood by the public. A lot of that stemming from half-baked journalism in the attempt to drive clicks and criticize development costs. When titles like Red Dead Redemption 2, for instance, also took 10 years, an equal level of funding, and only produced the game a fraction of the scope of what Star Citizen is aiming for. Just a little food for thought. But I want to thank you all for dropping by and giving this video a watch. If you found this content interesting or entertaining, we'd greatly appreciate you showing your support through a like, comment, or even subscribe. Star Citizen is a game that I've wanted to cover for years now, but I didn't feel it was in a decent place to do so till now. So I hope that you all come along with me for the ride. My name is Livid, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the verse.